Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Ansel. From Risa Walker, the award-winning author of the best-selling Kronos Files, and debut author Caleb Amsel, comes a chilling story of altered reality and psychological terror. Chase Ray sits perfectly still, his thumbs traveling across the screen of the broken computer tablet, stuck in the nexus between two worlds. Haddon Wood isn't real. It can't be. Another world, another reality, hovers just beyond his reach. He can see it sometimes. He can almost touch it. In that world, things are in balance. The dead stay dead and the creature feature remains safely on the screen. That world isn't a patchwork quilt of every scary book or movie he's seen. In that world, the nightmares generally end when you open your eyes and people don't glitch in and out of existence. Chase is determined to return to that world, although he's a bit worried that the only way out is through the noose that seems to lurk around every corner. He needs allies to get back home. But how do you choose your team when you can't tell who's real? As the Crow Flies, Enter Haddon Wood, Book One by Risa Walker and Caleb Amsel. Simon Says, The John Simon Thriller, Book One by Brian Thomas Schmidt. Master Detective John Simon is a tough, streetwise 17-year veteran of the Kansas City Police Department with a healthy disdain for the encroachment of modern technology into his workplace. When his partner is kidnapped after a routine stakeout by thugs with seeming ties to connected, wealthy art dealer Benjamin Ashman, he's determined to find the truth. But the only witness is a humanoid android named Lucas George. Reluctantly, he takes Lucas along as he begins to investigate and soon finds himself depending more and more on the very technology he so distrusts. Meanwhile, Simon's precocious teenage daughter begins to teach Lucas how to sound more like a cop using dialogue from famous cop movies. If only he'd use them in the appropriate context. This exciting new mix of near-future science fiction and procedural thriller captures the gritty realism of Michael Connelly's Bosch, the humor and action of Lethal Weapon, and follows the classic science fiction tradition of Isaac Asimov's City of Steel. From the editor of the international best-selling phenomenon The Martian by Andy Weir and the national best-selling author of tales including official entries in The X-Files, Predator, and the Joe Ledger thrillers comes the action-packed first entry in an exciting new series. Be sure to pick up Simon Says by Brian Thomas Schmidt and get into the series on the ground floor. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure a bloodhound with a terrifying past who'll stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi. A cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic. Delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. 
survivor, mother, leader, and humanity's last chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have George Stone on the show with me today. Uh, George is the editor-in-chief of National Geographic, uh, and he's here today to talk about this brand new book. It's it's not just by George. We were, we were talking about that. This is really a team effort. Uh, from the crew at National Geographic. It's called Epic Journeys, 245 Life-Changing Adventures. And uh, George has written uh, the foreword to the book and really sets the tone uh, for this. And uh, guys, I'm, I was just talking to George about it. I'm, I'm sitting here flipping through the pages of this massive uh, you know, kind of coffee table style book uh, you might refer to it as. It's absolutely gorgeous, just stunning. Um, welcome to the show, George. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. I, I'm happy to have you. Uh, George, we begin each show with the same question. And since you are the representative today, you get the question. Um, <laughs> what is what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? My first memory um, is of being read to. And, uh, um, and, and I, th- and I, I think cause you know, that is a touchstone memory that I'm sure most people can relate to, but it can't be said enough how important it is to read to young people. Um, and it doesn't matter how silly the book is, um, because what it means when you read to another person is that you see them and you respect them and you take them seriously. And it means so much to a a little person when a big person takes them seriously. And so um, I remember being read to, um, you know, as a kid and, you know, in some of the books, they they weren't, they weren't travel books for sure. I mean, it's like Amelia Bedelia or Dr. Seuss or, you know, Alexander and the Terrible, Horrible, No Good, Very Bad Day and all these things like that. And, um, and it gave me a sense of, um, you know, I wouldn't have said it then, a sense of story or a sense of a story arc, you know. But what it really did was um, create a kind of connection or a, a little community um, that was around a word. And uh, my mom uh, was a newspaper journalist, so uh, she wrote at the Toledo Blade um, in Toledo, Ohio, where I grew up. And I delivered that paper. So as I grew up, um, you know, I, I, as a little kid, I made money on words by delivering a newspaper. And um, and that also kind of reinforced the importance of a word. In that sense, it was journalistic. And then I think the last key moment was um, a, uh, a great friend of mine was the grandfather of my best friend growing up. And his name is Abe Steinberg. And um, he wanted to help us understand moments of history. And we were in sixth grade, and um, he uh, gave Andy and me each a copy of Elie uh, Wiesel's Night, um, uh, the memoir of the Holocaust, which is, yes, a heavy thing to do at that age. Um, But he wanted us each to create a report, and it was tough going. Um, But but it was an incredibly important um, experience because – Again, it was a grown up taking a younger person and their thoughts seriously 
um, and really reinforcing that um, that that sort of community through something that had been written down and something that that is about worlds that we couldn't know just sitting in Toledo, Ohio. So so throughout my life, I've been very fortunate um, to have people who know and love words and respect them share, but more, most importantly, they want to share them. So, um, you, you talk about this, uh, this grown up who challenged you to see the world differently. Um, was there, uh, another moment, uh, of challenge that, um, uh, that you could put your finger on that, that made you want to, um, put your stamp on the world, share your words, um, uh, you know, being challenged to see things the way you've never seen them um, is a fantastic thing if we can remember those those pivotal moments. But what was the catalyst that made you want to put something into the world? Mm, it, it, I wish I were an epic person, <laughs> and um, I'm not. And um, I, uh, I'm a I'm slow moving. I'm actually a very slow reader, and I'm not necessarily a fast. Thinker, but um, but uh, but so I move into things, um, you know, kind of cautiously some of the time, and maybe that's why you know I'm an I'm an editor. Um, I work with a lot of people who are out telling stories, um, and then I sort of am pretty good at organizing those um, and sharing them with the world. But um, but for me, um, it, I would say it, it was probably. Um, Again, the experience of sharing. My first job out of college was teaching um, in Minneapolis, and I was teaching eight-year-olds. And um, I'm a terrible. Well, I'm not a. Ter- I'm good company, but I'm not a, a well-trained teacher. And so, and that was the problem is um, that you know I thought it was great to hang out with the kids. I didn't know what I was doing, and so everything sort of devolved into story hour. And um, uh, I didn't last long in that job, incidentally, only six months. But, um, but, um, but there again, meeting people who are very different. Um, these are eight-year-olds from the inner city in uh, Minneapolis, and um, and seeing how they experience the world, going out on little field trips with them, seeing the wonder in the world, seeing, hearing funny things that they would say, point out, you know. Kids, when they're out in a city, maybe they want to claim things. So they'd say, that's my car. That's my building. And you could just imagine this fantasy world of, you know, that they're populating the world and becoming familiar with it. So for me, it was never any one great moment, but um, but always little moments um, that built up to um, to my – that increased my curiosity and that with – you know, fortunately, um, I, I can remember some of these great moments. So whether it's something I've read that just pops up, um, especially poetry, um, you know, that inspires another thought, um, I, I just see that people are layers and layers and layers of – of ideas and memories and experiences and the, the um, you know, it's a gift to, to have that. And so nothing is really ever lost. Uh, going from, uh, from, as you described, great company for eight year olds to, uh, to a travel writer. What was that path like? Um, so uh, when I, when I was young, I, and I had my paper out, um, people, um, on the route would save, I was interested in coins and stamps from around the world and they'd save these for me and then they'd give them to me and they'd also tell me stories of where they'd gone. I didn't leave the country until I was about 16. So, um, which, which is still, you know, I was very lucky to, I went to France. Um, but, um, but I really didn't start traveling until I was 22 and, um, went on my, um, on a big backpacking adventure in Southeast Asia. Um, so, uh, so it, 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 you know, it was this, um, it was the starting to see that there are dots in the world that can be connected and, uh, um, that curiosity can be responded to, um, that, you know, anything could sort of, uh, inspire a journey. So say you like Thai food and then someday it occurs to you, well, wouldn't it be interesting since I like Thai food to go to Thailand where they make Thai food all the time? <laughs> and, um, and, you know, and I kind of think it's just, um, very, uh, some of the time it's very, 
small points of curiosity that can lead you around the world. And that's why, you know, we hear a lot from readers um, at Nat Geo who love train travel or they are avid birders. And um, and these points of curiosity um, are like the building block of a great uh, journey. And so, so I think that's the case for a lot of people. It, it has been for me. I've been lucky at this point to go to a lot of places. Um, and um, and the more I travel, the um, the more I value um, wild, beautiful places. Um, just a month ago, I was in Vancouver Island um, in British Columbia, kayaking, and I saw a bird and a bald eagle and um, and otters and all these, you know, wonderful creatures. Plus, old growth forests of so these tremendous trees, these uh, cedars. And um, it's just, uh, you know, a remarkable experience to see the variety of the world. And I think when you do see any place, you start becoming more curious about other places. You start caring about other places. When uh, when you have been at uh, National Geographic for for quite a while now, um, what was the first job uh, that that landed you there? Well, um, so I out out of out of college, I knew I wanted to go um, into um, in, into publishing and, and magazine writing in particular because I'm, it's it's a different kind of a craft from news journalism and um, and I like the stories and I like the pictures and I like the texture of of this format of storytelling and um, so uh, but to get to be a travel writer or at least work in <laughs> this I ended up going through a, a secure a circuitous path um, of working for a senior citizens magazine and I wasn't an old person or a parents magazine I wasn't a parent and I worked at a garden magazine I wasn't a gardener and <laughs> I worked at a food magazine and I didn't know how to cook so um, <laughs> so like that. But I learned the craft of magazine making, and I learned well, and, the craft and, of storytelling. And I see a pattern there of being the the person that is uh, that is not or is a little out of your element. Uh, do you think that helps you to see things that other people don't normally see because you're kind of the outsider? Yeah, that's a really great point. Um, I do feel that way. Um, I often feel invisible, <laughs> and uh, um, and uh, and I don't know if I am or not. But um, but I don't have much of a um, of a big ego, and um, and so uh, so I feel you know I feel like I can um, I can be in a lot of different places uh, comfortably, and uh, um, I don't feel like I take up that much space in some ways, and that helps me observe things and. Um, and um, and I'm not afraid to ask questions. So one of the uh, you know one of the the opportunities that writing gives uh, that any writer can claim is um, you know the chance to ask a question. So um, it's a it's an unusual form of license where um, you know not everybody walks around the world and and inquires um, because it's seen as you know sort of invading someone else's space. But suddenly if you say, well, I'm a writer, <laughs> um, I'm a journalist or something like that. And then people are like, oh, oh, well, I'll answer your question. And a question that might have seemed to be somewhat personal um, just becomes a tool for collecting a story. So, um, so I think creating a kind of neutral space for a writer um, and putting someone at ease then um, you know, creates those opportunities just to have an exchange. Um, you wrote an article uh, several years ago. Uh, it was called Secrets of a Travel Writer, and you give tips uh, for people that are on their own personal adventures, uh, how they might get more out of it by approaching it as as a travel writer would. And you give some uh, some very great uh, tips. Assign yourself, uh, you know, give give yourself. Uh, you know, tasks to do and things that that you're specifically looking for. Ask a million questions. Uh, skip the mm -hmm. grid. Hire a guide. Um, get dirty. Get down to the uh, to ground level to see things. Um, you know, I I remember as a kid growing up in the '70s and '80s, National Geographic was was our window to the world. You know, before the internet, uh, if if you wanted to see. Uh, you know, these uh, these crazy exotic places or maybe just, you know, our, our neighbors 
uh, a few states over, and we didn't really have the opportunity to to see things of the world. National Geographic was our window to the world. Um, the uh, you know, as the internet has has opened the world up to us, and we get to see more and hear more, and and even interact from people uh, around the world. Um, do you think that because the world is so open um, due to technology, that we're losing some of that ability to get down to the ground level and experience things? Um, or uh, how do you feel like technology I- is affecting our ability to interact with the world. Yeah, I, it's a super topic. I mean, I think technology right now is creating tension, is creating some uh, friction. Um, the um, Obviously, um, it, it creates huge opportunities. So, I mean, I think everyone knows how important, uh, um, you know, our digital world is for sharing our stories um, uh, or through social media. Nonetheless, um, in travel specifically, you see people, you know, obsessed with Instagramming their experiences in real time. And what's not happening in real time is like actually soaking up the experience where they are. Um, I mean, the the, the ultimate, um, you know, outcome of that is when people are like doing selfies and they somehow walk off the edge of a cliff, <laughs> which happens every single year, probably to 10 people. And um, so that's one way. But the um, the idea of um, of time is being challenged by technology where, um, you know, people could be on all the time. They can be lots of different places all the time. Um, they can uh, stay up late exchanging ideas. Well, that's fine. But um, but I really think that there are some um, Things in life that need to be done slowly and um, and thoughtfully and um, where technology just needs to take a back seat. So going back to my walk in the woods uh, and um, and outside of Tofino and uh, Vancouver um, Island, um, then, um, you know, it like it would seem it's it felt gross to um to deal with technology that much i mean um we were looking at um you know walking along a path that is a little slippery um that was handmade of chopped cedar wood um by some indigenous people who uh, managed that land um around old growth forests in lush um lush uh rainy afternoon um, looking at, you know, ferns and ground cover and, you know, earth that had been overturned and mushrooms and um, some birds and then uh, trees that are low and then trees that are tall and ha- create a higher canopy. And you're doing this and you're breathing this great oxygen and you're thinking about this um, really important environment that, um, you know, that is just something that needs to be done, um, you know, quietly and introspectively and without the aid of a technology. And then later on, you can tell your story. But, um, but you know, the, the, the obsessive uh, reflex of, of grabbing your phone to take a picture and then, eh, I mean, maybe you don't need that picture. Maybe, maybe it's, it's okay not even to remember it, um, just to, to have that experience in the moment. You know, it's it's a weird thing, um, technology, because uh, I, I definitely don't ever want to sound like one of those anti-technology people. Um, I, I We get to do this show because of the Internet, and, uh, you know, we're uh, I, I'm using Skype, and you're on a telephone, and uh, I'm recording it right now, and then we're going to broadcast it later to the world. And, uh, you know, we have people on, on social media that we've become friends with. That, that maybe we never meet in person. Um, but I think we just, I, I think you, you said it beautifully. We, we've really got to find that balance of, of getting our feet dirty and putting the phone away and, and know when each thing has its place. Maybe. I, th- I think so. And um, I mean, I, I don't find that I have enough time to sit and read, but um, I can see that the time to sit and read um, is being stolen <laughs> some of the time by my curiosity about seeing what's on Instagram. And um, but there are only so many hours in a day. And so um, I'm I really am trying to um, train myself back into 
reading articles, um, uh, even some of the time, you know, printing out things from online. So I just sit and don't have a screen anymore. Um, uh, it, to me, it's helpful. And and it's not only that, but um, we are doing a story. We just um, have finalized a cool story that I think people who love to read and love to write will like. So this is by a great travel writer named Don George. And um, he, I, I, <laughs> I sent him to the National Geographic Archives, which is in our basement. And he, um, he's a guy who's used to going halfway around the world. You know, he expected that I'd send him to Tahiti. Instead, I sent him to like an air-conditioned basement. And, um, and, uh, and what I wanted to do is figure out what would the experience be like of spending a week traveling in the imagination um, with the help of these National Geographic photos, um, you know, that go back um, to probably the 18. Um, 90s. The first Nat Geo image was published um, roughly around then. Um, and uh, so, and, you know, and he was at first daunted, but then he um, went through these stacks and he saw worlds that uh, are different. Some worlds don't exist the way they do anymore. Some don't exist at all, like the um, the great Buddha statues of Bamiyan, um, which were, um, which were blown up. And, um, or um, images that Hiram Bingham on a National Geographic grant took of Machu Picchu, which he uncovered um, again in, in about 1911, 1912, and it was published in 1913. Well, these are the the very pictures of that explorer, um, pictures of a jungle-covered Machu Picchu, and then pictures of Machu Picchu without the jungle covering it because they cleared it away. And then you can, um, you know, fast forward to today, and, um, and it's very much a part of, um, you know, sort of iconic tourism um it's it, it, so i think these journeys of the imagination um sometimes are really assisted by um by printed matter and um so books and um you know pictures um or um just being in a different context that happens not to be the screen of a computer or a phone sure um through years of reading the magazine and uh you know, learning so much about the world uh, around me, um, you know, you can't help but uh, get a little fire lit inside you that, you know, I would love to experience that for myself. Um, is, what is the ultimate goal of National Geographic? Is it to, uh, it, it, you know, do, is the goal to challenge people to want to experience this for themselves? Is it to, to see things that we'll never get to? Is it a, a mixture of that? How do you approach uh, serving your audience? We'll put it that way. Well, so when National Geographic was founded in 1888, the goal was um, was also stuck in its time. Um, it, it was for the, quote for the increase in diffusion of geographical knowledge. So there was this sense of mission at that point um, of documenting the world, exploring the world, and even claiming the world. And you know that is um, that evolved into I think um, a sort of um, a better place, which was um, which was sharing aspects of the world with a, with a very hungry audience in North America through National Geographic magazine. So um, when the title started to publish pictures, when it started to embrace um, a popular audience as opposed to a scientific or an elite audience, that's when that geo really hit its stride. So. Um, at that point, and from then on, the idea has been um, uh, all about exploration, conservation, and storytelling. Um, storytelling through documentary, um, nonfiction uh, tools, photography, writing, illustration. Ultimately, the goal is to get people to care about the planet, um, to get people to recognize um, our world, sometimes the challenges and fragility of the world, um, and um, and care for it. And so um, there's no better way to start to care about the planet than to get out there and see aspects of it yourself. And that also then breaks down the barriers so that when you see something on TV – um, you know, the Amazon is on fire or something, then um, you're like, well, okay, that's remote and that's far away. But maybe it's not so far away if you spent time in a forest, any forest, and you say, well, this is a really beautiful and lush place. And wow, you know, it would be terrible to lose this forest that's near my house. Um, you know, what is happening down there in the Amazon and why does that matter? 
um, I think when people make that connection, then the world becomes a little bit smaller in a good way. Right. Um, which brings us to the new book, Epic Journeys, 245 Life-Changing Adventures. Um, you know, I, I've seen a number of National Geographic collections through the years, and they're usually topical and, uh, you know, really collect um, a lot of the information that's been published and, and allow people to do a deep dive on, you know, a, a certain topic or a certain locale. Um this book is a little different in that uh, it really lays out, uh, you know, things that we can go do. And, and you even issue a personal challenge in the forward uh, about, you know, thinking, you know, uh, about the adventure life and, and how to, uh, you know, not just embrace the, the mundane. Um, what was the, what was the spirit behind this collection? Uh, Cause it, it seems to me, that um, in, in reading through it, that it really is trying to make the world around us more accessible for regular people. And, and some of them are more accessible depending on where you already are in the world. Um, but it, it, it's really full of practical information as well. Um, what, was the, what was the genesis of this collection? Yeah, and, 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 and um, I, I really appreciate that you said that because the genesis of this one was to be as practical as we can be. So um, Epic Journey says 245 life-changing adventures. So we're leaning into adventure, but not every adventure is – you know, we don't have a technical climb up Mount Everest in this book. You know, we have hikes and kayaking trips, and um, and yeah, you can you can um, summit uh, Mount Kilimanjaro. That's a strenuous hike, but that's something that a lot of people can do. Um, we uh, talked to our photographers and our writers, and also canvassed our readers to ask what are the adventures that they've had that have been the best or what are the ones they're most curious about? And uh, um, and then we also put in ones that we thought were just really terrific and important. Um, one I like, for instance, is um, stargazing in the Atacama Desert. Um, this is, um, you know, this is sort of, and this is northern Chile's uh, um, very barren, um, very beautiful but stark um, uh, desert. And um What's important about this is um, the experience of seeing a clear, dark sky, um, getting a sense of not only um, a, a part of this planet, but also where our planet is situated within our solar system. And so, um, you know, you can see the stars in a lot of places. You don't have to go to the Atacama Desert. Um, so we really want people to make that connection. What is important about this particular item is um, is that there's an increasing emphasis on protecting night sky or dark sky destinations around the world because light pollution is increasingly a problem. But I think everyone can relate to just the joy of suddenly having a, a night where you look up and the stars are all out and you can barely believe it. And you remember – that this is happening every day, but you know, but maybe you're in a city, maybe it's cloudy, maybe you just forgot to look up. But um, there are these amazing places around the world that are connected with our own experience at home, and that's kind of what we wanted to do: is say, um, you know, here are terrific experiences. Here's how to go have them. Here's how to go on safari. Here are great train rides in Europe. Um, here are birding adventures. But um, you don't have to go far away. Maybe it's just cool to read about them. Um, it, but it would be awesome if you would go someplace <laughs> because um, because you're going to come away with a great story. Right. right. Um, the book is laid out in a very practical manner. Uh, you know, when you're in the in the front of the book, you, you, you're reading through the contents and it, it's broken down. The first section is South and Central America and then Africa, Europe, Asia, Oceania, North America than the polar regions. Um, but in the back of the book, you've got a really great index. And like you were talking about earlier, um, it, you know, it's the index can help you find a specific place or a specific region. But if you're interested in stargazing, like you mentioned, um, you know, you've got a handy reference in there for all of the articles that will, uh, you know, lead you on a stargazing adventure. Uh, it's really, uh, not only very well presented, but but very accessible. I, I keep going back to that because it's uh, it's just really easy to use, and the 
the photographs in uh, in National Ge- Geographic style are stunning, um, absolutely stunning. Uh, how long did it take to put this collection together? It, it took about a little less than two years. So, um, so from the time we started talking to all the you know all the writers and photographers and collecting our ideas to then assigning new stories. Um, and then looking into um, the stories that we'd already published to see, well, do we want to, you know, take a, a part of this? For instance, um, the writer I mentioned before, Don George, um, who I sent into the basement, I had previously sent to um, Burning Man, the big festival. <laughs> um, uh, and um, so he's, you can tell that he's the, he's my guinea pig writer. I'm just like, I don't know. I'm going to send Don and make him do this thing. So, um, but there were some stories that, um uh, that we loved from the past. So we, um, we kind of re-edited them in a way to capture the, the voice of the author. Another one that I love is uh, Peter Gwynn, who's a, a stellar Nat Geo uh, writer and reporter, went on, um, on the trail of Arabian horse history in Oman and um, uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. And so it's like a really cool, surprising story. And these pictures are terrific. And, um, so, uh, so, you know, over this period of, um, of nearly two years, just collecting and organizing itineraries and lists and photos and everything like that, we finally narrowed it down, but it does take some time. And then, um, it's always like kind of a small miracle as anyone who writes anything can, can it can relate to when it finally is over and um and then you know it gets printed up and then um shipped out right um you know this uh I, you know my wife and i have have always uh kind of had an adventure spirit uh and then we went through quite a number of years of raising kids and uh where we didn't get to adventure a whole lot because, you know, you've got little kids at home and stuff like that. Well, our kids are mostly grown now. We, our youngest son is, is a sophomore in high school and we can really get out and do a little traveling and, you know, see the world more. And, uh, you know, we just love to get out. And if we go to a a new city or a a new region and to get off of the, the strip, you know, and, and find what, what do people that live here eat? What, what do they do for entertainment? Uh, because you can find an Olive Garden in any, you know, city of, you know, 40,000 people or more probably. But, you know, where, where do people that live here, what did, what did they do? And, uh, I, I love that this book approaches travel in that way and, uh, really challenges you to, uh, to get your hands and feet dirty. Um, for you, George, what are some of your favorite adventures that, that might be covered in this book? And, and what uh, are things on your bucket list that you want to do uh, bef- before you uh, can't? My the bucket list is hard. The, the bucket list keeps growing. That's probably a good thing because then <laughs> it is. means you won't you won't fade away if you have a big long bucket exactly. list of must dos. <laughs> One thing that I have done that I love that we included in this book is um, is a self driving safari in South Africa. So a lot of people might think that um, that all safaris are you know too expensive because safari going on safari is a pretty pricey thing to do. But it's not true that all of them are too expensive. Um, and in South Africa, especially. Um, it's very easy to fly into Johannesburg, fly over to Durban in, um, in southeastern South Africa, rent a car um, as cheap as it is here in the States, um, buy gas uh, very inexpensively, and then drive around to these terrific um, national parks and uh, wilderness preserves um, in in South Africa, like Kruger National Park. So if people don't know it, um, you can drive yourself on these roads right through a massive wilderness park with elephants and giraffe and zebra. And you can hang out. You can, you know, (laughs) sip your (laughs) sip a Coke, um, you know, tell the kids to be quiet um, and to to shut off their, their like phones or something, but you can do it. It's a self-driving safari. So that discovery, um, you know, the accessibility of something like that, um, I think breaks down some cool barriers. So, um, so that and I would always say that you know that there's there are ways to have these terrific adventures around the world, and um, and 
and I think that, you know, that, that travel's not a competition. You're not supposed to go everywhere. You can't go everywhere. But, um, but if you really want to go somewhere, it is possible to have that experience. One I'd like to do, but I haven't done is I have not, um, hiked, um, up to the top of Kilimanjaro. Um, so also in Africa and Kilimanjaro is this highest point in, um, the African continent. Um, it's a, uh, um, the fabled snows of Kilimanjaro, a glacier on, on the top that is rapidly melting, very sadly, and um, and it's a you know it's a strenuous multi-day hike, but a sort of exhilarating experience. So I would love to do that. Are there um, is traveling easier um, than people think it is, and, and by that is it more accessible? Uh, you know, I think a lot of people just assume that getting out of your spot in the world. Uh, is just too daunting. It, it costs too much. It's it's too much of a commitment here and there. Um, it, is it becoming easier for people to get out and, and see the world around them? Um, it is. Um, it's. Um, I think. It, but but oddly enough, that crashes back into the technology problem. So it is easier to see places. There are more flights. There are more tools for travelers, and in many ways, we have technology to thank for that. Um, uh, you can get on the ground. You can use your phone. You can get, you know, cell reception. You can figure out how to get on a bus. You can uh, how to get into the city. You can book reservations last minute. Um, all these different things. Um, but um, you can book like experiences on the ground once you're there without even planning that much, like on Airbnb experiences, these little daytime tours. Um, uh, you know, but um, but. Along with that comes, um, you know, the challenge of possibly places uh, taking on a certain similarity, um, and you can see that in in cities first. So densely populated places, freaking out over the latest movie, it's all the same movie. Um, you know, grabbing coffee, it's all the same coffee. Um, wearing clothes, they're all from Uniqlo or you know or something, and. Um, and you're like, well, that was not as different as I expected. And um, so, um, so that's that's a challenge, and I think that's going to be an ongoing challenge. But places, cultures, people are very different, and um, and I think that's what we're trying to surface in our book, and pretty much in everything we do at National Geographic is the wonder of the world, what makes places special, what makes uh, um, you know cultures, all cultures, significant but unique, and uh, create opportunities to discover them. And, you know, and really what creates a rich life story that everyone can come home and share, um, what adds to your experience of living on this planet and travel can really help. Well, the very first adventure uh, that people should take is uh, while sitting in their comfy armchair and uh, and looking through Epic Journeys 245 life-changing adventures uh george i absolutely love this book i love the the work that you guys are doing and continue to do um we're going to send everyone to pick up their copy of the book it's out available everywhere now in this this lush gorgeous hardback um edition uh if people are uh, want to know more about all of the work that you do is there a place where they can connect with you online george there is um, at nationalgeographic.com. You can buy this book, Epic Journeys, at shopnatgeo.com. And, uh, um, and you can get trip planning tools and inspiration at natgeotravel.com. So we have daily stories, beautiful pictures, weekly newsletter, and we are all about getting out to see the world. Excellent. We're going to send everyone to see you, George, and to pick up a copy of the book. Uh, this has been so much fun chatting. Thank you so much for taking time to come it's on the show. It's been a delight. Thank you very much, Hank. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. What in the name of Carl Sagan was he doing in the cemetery on Halloween? What was he thinking? He whirled, expecting the headless horseman himself to be waiting on the road ahead. Or was he lurking behind? He wanted to run, but now the bridge ahead worried him. Doesn't the horseman haunt bridges? Could he avoid crossing it somehow? It terrified him. Why? It was just a stupid bridge. The gloom beneath could have been the lair of a troll. Billy Goat's Gruff. Mama used to read that. The troll waits beneath for the fattest, sweetest goat. Jason thought he saw something on the far end of the bridge. A shape of some sort. 
he stepped onto the bridge and gripped the knotty railing. He felt the ground drop away beneath as he edged forward. His eyes remained on the shape. It's nothing. It's nothing. Is it nothing? No troll attacked him as he reached the other shore. The looming shape was only a stupid stairwell opposite the bridge that climbed up the hill and into the main cemetery. He turned left and ran, admitting defeat and letting the fear take him over. He ran southward down the long, dark road. His initial burst of adrenaline ran its course and he slowed, then walked again, limping a little. Headstones slipped past on the right. He still had enough light that he caught his reflection occasionally in the polished stone. He looked very young and very thin. He could feel his vulnerability as he walked along. He grew aware of his own body, the touch of his starchy dress shirt and his jacket and the soft weight of his backpack. He saw himself reflected in the headstones, just a container of warm fluids, flimsy work for a blade or a hoof or a sword. He felt shatterable and transient, and his next breath was not guaranteed, oh no. The leaves made a faint oceanic rustle all around. The insects sang their three-note songs. Jason Crane, Jason Crane, Jason Crane. Jason sang a wretched pop song as he walked, something about having no self-control and no bitches and not enough money. He sang it softly, absent-mindedly, as if reciting a psalm. He passed Reese, Finnerton, Bain, Ekdal, Forest, Black, Small. There. He saw the gate at the end of the road. But the gate would be locked, he remembered. He would have to climb the embankment and cross over the churchyard. He could see the spire of the church above and the weather vane spinning against the sky. He would rather climb this gate than face that churchyard, but the spikes on top made leaping the fence impossible. Okay, just be quick. Something caught his ear, a brittle, clipping sound. He scanned the crest above and saw a horse silhouetted among the graves. It looked to be tied to a branch of the locust tree. He had heard its hooves as it shifted from foot to foot. It rustled somehow. His breath caught. He forced himself to be calm and rational. Some Halloween thing, maybe, for some event. He found the stairs and ascended, sideways, ready to bolt if necessary. He watched the horse, but when he neared the top he saw the rider, standing upon the shallow depression of the horseman's grave. The figure was motionless, a dim shape that absorbed light and gave nothing back. He could make out the shape of the boots and the legs and two arms held away from the body, palms down. Just a man? But the cape of the thing was not normal. It contorted painfully, twisting in the air even though the wind wasn't blowing. It wrung itself and billowed and whipped slowly, as if the figure wore a wave torn from a black ocean. And above its shoulders, is he headless? Is he headless? 